Korean War is one that resides in a gray and hazy mist in the minds of most Americans. Described by S.L.A. Marshall as the century's nastiest little war, it is for this reason that it is often shied away from in history books. Korea was a war that almost no one wanted to fight. It began just a few short years after World War II and was the first military conflict of the Cold War. U.S. fears of communism ran high, and the pressure to stop the spread of communist beliefs ran even higher. For this reason, when communist North Korea invaded South Korea with seven divisions on June 25, 1950, world fears spiked. The initial reaction to the invasion was that of shock and fear. Americans pondered many communist-related questions, most pertinent among them, was this assault ordered by Soviets? Were the North Koreans simply Moscow's pawns? And was this the first of a series of provocative communist movements around the world? The United States was dedicated to stopping the spread of communism. For this reason, Korea became a battleground over two very different types of government, communist and democratic. The UN forces were comprised primarily of Americans. However, the American military did not have enough regulars, so the reserves were called up across the nation. The North Korean army began an assault south in late June 1950. President Truman saw this as a clear case of Soviet aggression and called a meeting of the UN Security Council. North Korea was condemned as an aggressor and the UN was called to action. Within a few days, American troops, formerly positioned in Japan, were fighting alongside an outmatched South Korean army. The shock of the sudden invasion and consequent war with the North Koreans is also evident in the lack of readiness of the military. Military brass was clearly not prepared for such a large-scale war, and men were often rushed to the front lines with incomplete or non-existent training, due to an urgent need for troops in Korea. I think it was such a rush to get troops over to Korea that some of them were overlooked and sent to Korea without giving boot camp. And I don't think any of that was intentional. This unfortunate scenario was exemplified by the Evansville-based C Company of the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve. I think the thing that caught our eye was how unprepared America was for the Korean War and how reservists and National Guards people uh, can sometimes find themselves uh, because they signed a piece of paper and thought they were going to get some free schooling <laughs> or have fun wearing uniforms, suddenly find themselves in the middle of war with very little training. And that was the story of C Company. Following World War II, the government was mostly focused on retooling the wartime economy. Returning veterans went home and started businesses and families. By the end of 1946, there were less than 2.5 million men in armed forces, down from the 15 million men 18 months prior. After World War II, everybody was done with war. We'd been in a de depression for 10 years, and we'd been in a war for five years, and people had been doing without for 15 years. So at the end of World War II, we beat the bad guys, the Germans and the Japanese. There weren't going to be any more wars. The Soviet Union hadn't started causing trouble yet. So uh, Harry Truman, who was president of the United States at the time, uh, got this pressure to demobilize the army, to break down the army, to make it as small as possible, and to uh, maybe even get rid of the Marine Corps. So in the process of that, the Marine Corps came up with a plan to save themselves. They said, look, cut us back but let us have these reserve companies. We'll have 120 of them in 120 cities in the United States. Evansville got one of them. Beginning after World War II, the reserves served as a way to make the military forces appear larger than they actually were. This system allowed people to sign up to serve and still carry on a regular life. Training was minimal and often optional. The reserves were mostly made up of young men in high school and veterans from World War II that wanted to remain in touch with their former friends. I was in Evansville after uh, I got discharged, got a job, didn't know anybody at all, and a friend of mine who was a Marine, uh, and he had joined in the reserves, and he urged me to come out there. I did, joined up, and I enjoyed it, and uh, stayed with it till the Korean War came along. The Evansville Marine Reserve Company was activated in the early fall of 1947, and Major Paul Torian became the commanding officer. As the commanding officer, Major Torian was given the responsibility of filling a 240-man roster. In order to fill his roster in the appropriated time, Torian turned to the four local high schools. He got the football coaches to create a platoon for each high school and to recruit the men from the school's athletic teams. Well, they just came to school and, and wanted you to sign up, and we signed up to 
you know, it was like having an extra job. We trained out to Armory once a month, and we got paid for it. It was like having a little part-time job. They'd come around with a program at all the high schools at that time and just joined it for the extra money, and the, some of my friends joined up. The men of C Company, 16th Infantry Battalion of Evansville, had many unique reasons for joining the Marines. Most believed they would never see action. Young men, recently out of high school, joined the Reserves Unit as a way to pay for college or gain additional privileges. The company believed military action was unlikely due to the recent end of World War II, so training was not a huge issue. Before being activated, the men from the company had only received a few weeks of summer camp. At the summer camp, why, basically you had, you know, close order drill, you had marching and things like that. You had very little combat experience, you just... We did go to rifle range and, and fire a few times, but you don't, you can't cram too much in two weeks. The men were sent to Camp Pendleton in California for formal training. While some men received special training that kept them out of duty longer, many of them left after only two weeks for Korea. They were promised that no man would go to Korea without six months of training. The first guy killed was killed less than a month after they left. General MacArthur turned the tide of the war by carrying out the brilliant Inchon invasion in September. This amphibious attack cut the North Korean army in half and destroyed all enemy troops in South Korea. This gave the U.S. government ideas of a new goal, a unified Korea. Throughout the entire conflict, China had stated that they would enter the war if the Americans attempted to reunite the Koreas. However, this threat was ignored by MacArthur and top Washington officials, who continued to encourage Truman that the Chinese would remain inactive. Secretary of State Dean Acheson said, I should think it would be sheer madness for the Chinese to intervene. Following his no substitute for victory slogan, MacArthur led the troops north and captured nearly all of North Korea. However, the advice Truman received from Acheson and MacArthur could not have been worse. The Chinese forces launched a surprise attack the day after Thanksgiving, catching American forces off guard. They plowed through the American lines and pushed them completely out of the country by December to go out on patrols, and in fact, they came in. They was cold. <laughs> the Chinese was freezing to death. In fact, about 40 or 50 came into our lines one day, and they just, you know, they had them cotton uniforms on, and they was freezing to death, so they all surrendered. And, uh, but you got to find the reason they, a lot of them guys were surrendering, because they fought for the nationalists, you know, Chinese. They wasn't communists. They taken and forced them to join the it's communist army, see, so they, as soon as they got a chance to surrender, they did. And they was telling, we was getting, getting this information from where they was coming across the Yalu River, hiding in the mountains, and they said they had two or three hundred thousand in there, you know, they could hide. And, and then they, and he gave us a warning not to come any closer than 20 miles to the Yalu River, and we did. When we did, they came in then, in force, you know. The only remaining U.S. troops in North Korea were surrounded by Chinese forces in the Chosen Reservoir. Among the troops trapped in the Chosen Reservoir were men from the Evansville Marine Company. While the situation was grim, the Evansville Courier tried to remain optimistic. They posted headlines that helped to ease the concerns of worried locals. The men were under constant threat of both the Chinese advance and the unforgiving weather. The elements took a large toll on many soldiers, as frostbite and frozen sleeping bags constantly reminded them of their situation. My sleeping bag froze. They'll get as hard as a rock. You get wet and get damp in the snow, and it freezes. And when you move out, you can't roll it up or nothing. And I, you just So I had it wired onto my back, and I'm going down through there, and we come under attack. And when you're under attack, it's just a lot different than just sitting here talking. And I'm going down this hill, and they're shooting at me, and bullets are flying everywhere. And I got this frozen bag tied on behind me, and I get tangled up in a bunch of these damn calm wires where these these wiremen string these wires all over, trying to get communications. And I get all tangled up in them damn wires, and I can't get away, and somebody's shooting at me. So I just got my knife and cut the thing off and throwed it down the hill so I could get away. Well, that was great in the daytime, but when it come nighttime, then I didn't have no no sleeping bag. Well, you can't always run back three or four miles or wherever you come from earlier in the day and find out what, 
go looking for what you lost earlier. You're just without it. For two weeks, the Americans held off Chinese advances. The enemy surrounded the American troops and was only held back from crushing the Americans by the constant support of the U.S. Air Force. The American forces were outnumbered and found themselves in a dismal situation. It's hard to put in words. You know, it's uh, something that was a surprise to everybody. Uh, it was cold, very cold. But it was a pretty day whenever we first noticed the Chinese when they came in. And they came in it just like in waves, just thousands of them seemed like they were, we were in a bowl here and they just came in all the way around us, you know. And of course, uh, of course, you know, uh, you, for some reason or other, you, you weren't scared, you were determined that they, that you were going to protect yourself and fight your way out. And it's something that's strange. Whenever battle comes on and, and you're waiting for battle, you get a little scared. You're nuts if you don't get scared. But you got to keep your composure. But during battle, it's automatic. If you're trained well, you do what you know you're supposed to do. What happened at the reservoir, we got surrounded by, I don't know, numerous divisions of Chinese. I can't tell you how many. It had to be four or five divisions more than what we had. And, and we would have never got out of there except only way that we got out of there is the, the Air Force was over us 24 hours a day. They just flew around us continually. They just make a circle round and around and around. And uh, any time they would get low on fuel and uh, before they would take off, well, another wave would come from the ships to replace them and they would fly in and take over. They kept over us 24 hours a day. After the men from the Chosen Reservoir fought their way out of their dire situation, they began a hasty retreat south. They were forced into an all-out retreat as China poured hundreds of thousands of men across the border into the war. Now the whistles were for the smaller units, but the bugles were for the larger units. So when you heard them bugles, you know you're going to get hit pretty hard. The retreat went into South Korea, and the U.S. troops were forced to once again abandon Seoul and Incheon to the Communist forces. People were everywhere, you know, besides the Chinese. Uh, the, uh, the residents were scrambling just to get out, to get safe, or, you know, they were wanting to get out. Everybody up north was trying to get back down south, so. Finally, the troops were able to halt the Chinese advance, and they slowly began recovering the lost South Korean territory. By early 1951, the UN forces had regained the 38th parallel, creating a standoff between the Chinese and American forces. And we fought up to the, almost to the Manchuria border, but then we got pushed back. We boarded ships at uh, Hung Nam and went back to Pusan, went up to, to Maison. And in the spring, or about in January, we started uh, pushed back up to the 38th parallel. The 38th parallel quickly resembled the fighting of World War I, trench warfare and heavy casualties for the sake of little ground. Truman and MacArthur disagreed on how to proceed. MacArthur believed that we should attack the North Koreans and Chinese again to unite the whole Korean peninsula, while Truman had had enough. MacArthur remained in control of the U.S. forces until April 1951, despite his glaring mistake on the initial invasion of North Korea, when he openly challenged Truman in Congress. Well, I think he made a lot of mistakes. Uh, just like us Marines, we captured Chinese a couple of months, scouts and stuff, before this, the, their invasion. And he didn't think they would do anything about it. And he, as far as I'm concerned, I think he had too much ego. Truman finally replaced MacArthur with Matthew Ridgway, who he felt shared the same goals for finding a resolution to the Korean War as he did. By the time Ridgway took command, the war had stalled, a strong defensive line across the 38th parallel had been established, and the trench warfare had begun. 
At this point in the war, peace talks began between the UN forces and the Chinese. The peace talks continued for the next two years until an armistice was finally reached in June 1953. In this two-year period, some of the war's fiercest fighting took place, and nearly half of the 140,000 United States casualties came from this span. While the men from C Company were there an average of 13 months, the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir was considered the most intense fighting they faced, and the memories from those two weeks still resonate in the minds of the soldiers. Returning troops were met with very little acknowledgement as they landed back in the States. When we landed in, uh, see, we landed in uh, Seattle, and we pulled in, and uh, of course it was just another day. Uh, we had a full ship of troops coming back from Korea. And, uh, of course, there was nobody there to greet us or anything. And we just kind of had to find our way, uh, directed uh, to where we could get on the next train or something home. So it was very simple. Now, coming back from World War II, we landed in San Diego. And there were bands out there greeting us, thanking us. But like the one of the guys said, well, it's so different. Uh, it felt like we just had to kind of sneak back into the country. Got home and just went, went after I got out of the service, why, just went on to work. Uh, in fact, uh, in the paper, they just a little bitty uh, thing that told, there was uh, about six or eight of us that came home that particular month, we rotated back, and we all just come home, got, got off the airplane, and went on home. The return for Korean veterans was very different than the return for World War II veterans. While the veterans were not necessarily looking for glory or honor, they had expected some form of a welcome and appreciation upon their return. Instead, the men were often quickly unloaded from their ships or planes and given directions to the nearest train or bus station or airport. Seemingly, the only sincere welcome came from family and close friends of the veterans. Well, uh, I didn't even write home that I was coming home. But somehow, my brother, who was a, he was a lieutenant in the Navy, somehow they found out that I was coming home on the USS, T USS Telfair, I think it was. And my wife and my brother met me at the dock. And instead of getting on a bus that took the Marines to Camp Pendleton, I got in his car and I, I drove to Camp Pendleton in his car, which was a 52 Cadillac, or 50, 51 Cadillac. So I rode in style getting back on the base. The veterans came to realize that they must quickly readjust to society and not dwell on Korea. More than five decades later, the men of the C Company, 16th Infantry Battalion, still meet for lunch every third Saturday of the month. They discuss current events and tell humorous stories from the war. These men share a special bond that can only be forged when facing death together. Troops remain in Korea to this day, still at the 38th parallel, watching and waiting. <laughs>